I'm Rob Brooks. I'm a professor of evolution at the University of New South Wales, and I think about sex for a living. It doesn't matter how long you live, if you don't have any children, you're an evolutionary loser. The primary evolutionary agenda that all individuals have is to find mates and to raise offspring. And that very, very potent, very important urge is captured in music and captured by music. And so music seems to be completely wound up in the process of courtship. If you look at it today, nobody starts a courtship out of earshot of a band or an iPod or a stereo. Biologically, there's, uh, we have to think about the reasons for making music, we have to think about the reasons for listening to music, and both of those groups benefit. But it's the music makers that benefit the most. We can show off just how cool we are, just how smart we are, our ability to improvise by playing music. From the day that you pick up your first musical instrument, at the back of your mind, there is the notion uh, that this is going to improve not only your access to potential mates, but it's also going to improve their perception of you. So uh, folks who play their first gig, when they play their first gig, suddenly there's a small crowd um, to whom they have access, to whom they have no need to introduce themselves or break the ice because that music has broken the ice already. And as the band gets better, as it becomes more accomplished, as it develops a following, that crowd of possible mates gets bigger and bigger and bigger until you get to the point where you're like the Rolling Stones were in about 1966 where women were sneaking into their rooms, into their hotel rooms and hiding in the closets just to get close to them. Men grasped rock and roll and they made it, they fashioned it into a male reproductive agenda. Women musicians, partly because they didn't have as much access to the chance to record, the chance to play music um, and recording contracts, um, didn't jump on the rock and roll bandwagon and fashion it into a, a female reproductive agenda. But, you know, since the 80s and um, the 90s, we've seen this enormous proliferation of different sexual personae um, that women are projecting. Uh, people like Madonna, now we've got Beyonce and Lady Gaga pro projecting very, very sexualized uh, versions of themselves. And those are bought by young women because um, they can relate to it and, and that's the music that they can relate to. It's like a breath of fresh air. I think at the back of their mind, a lot of musicians know that it's what's in their pants uh, that matters. Uh, you know, people look at Tiger Woods and they wonder how he could possibly have done all that he did um, as a sports star. He had the world at his feet. Um, but, you know, 14-year-old boys don't practice golf for 10 hours a day because they only want to be good golf players. At the back of their minds, there is the notion of rampant and easy access to lots of women. Um, and that's a very immature male agenda, um, and it's driven by evolution. And, um, you know, folks who think that Tiger's got some rare affliction are either deluding themselves or they're trying to deceive somebody close to them because um, it's not a surprise why Tiger Woods did what he did. And it's the same thing with rock and roll. People don't start playing rock and roll music just because of the music. I know they love the music. Um, and that's often a separate and a more conscious uh, motivation. But people play rock and roll because at the back of their mind, uh, they know that they're going to get their money for nothing and their checks for free. Nothing is for free, and particularly anything involved in courtship. Anything sexy comes at a big cost. The crickets we study in my lab, the males, um, the best males, call all night long, but they end up dying much sooner than the worst males. And the same is true with music. In order to get to the top, in order to persevere and win and get to the, you know, on the long way to the top of rock and roll, you really have to push yourself. You have to take chances, you have to take risks, and taking risks means you discount the future. And so we find that uh, men in particular, but men and women both, who get involved in this high risk, high reward strategy, um, will end up uh, involved in violence, they'll end up uh, involved in drugs, in alcohol, not looking after themselves, eating bad food, having sex with the wrong people, and as a consequence of that, some of them die. You have almost twice the chance of dying five years after becoming famous as another person who never became famous. It's a successful strategy in terms of immortality, 
um, the, the immortality that a lot of folks are striving for when they strive for fame. I mean, Kurt Cobain's probably more famous today than he would have been if he hadn't stayed alive. Is it a successful strategy in terms of leaving large numbers of offspring? Well, Jagger's had something like seven children to four different women, four of the most desirable women on the planet in four different decades. Uh, and so there's an enormous variety of ways to succeed in leaving copies of your genes um, and in becoming a successful ancestor.